What's up, y'all? I'm Alan Hayne, the Lawn Care Nut, and this is episode 15 of Lawns Across America. So welcome back, y'all. I'd like to say a warm welcome to all of you that are out there listening. As you mow your lawns, you're listening to the podcast. I've gotten quite a bit of feedback from folks that say, yeah, Al, I like the podcast. I actually put it on while I'm doing my weekend mow. I would like to welcome you guys to the podcast. I also have a bunch of you that have written in and said that you actually enjoy listening to the podcast while you're at work. It's good background noise for you, whether it's in headphones or you're putting it out on your personal speaker there on your desk or whatever you're doing. It's just nice to hear the talk in the background. So appreciate you guys. Thanks for being here. And then yet there's another group of folks that are telling me that they are listening to the podcast as they're yet commuting. And so this could be even Friday night. This podcast comes out on a Thursday, but this could be a Friday night that you're commuting home and you're about ready to start your weekend. So I want to welcome every one of you here to episode 15, again, of Lawns Across America. Now, I'm reminded as I kind of go out and ramble in that way, I'm reminded of one of my favorite country songs from 1985 by a band called Alabama. They had a song called 40 Hour Week for a Living. And uh, I'm kind of shouting out to all you working folks out there, wherever you're at. And that's kind of what their little, their song was about. If you YouTube search that, you'll find it. It's a good song I think you should listen to while you're mowing this weekend, but they their lyrics kind of go, you know, you work a 40-hour week for a living just to send it on down the line. And they're like shouting out like Detroit auto workers, and they're shouting out to the firemen, and they're shouting out to the policemen. They're shouting out all these different folks that are out there working and making America move and making America work and make the clocks tick around the country. And they're shouting out to you saying, thanks for the 40-hour work week. Thanks for working hard to make America so you know, what it is. And I want to thank all of you all for listening to this podcast and for making our community what it is. So thank you very much wherever you're at, however hard you're working. Thanks for making me a part of that day. Now this week, as I got in a couple different emails, I actually got into a conversation with a young man. Well, he's 38, but he actually, as our conversation, which I'll share a piece of it here, but as our conversation, this is an email conversation, went on, it reminded me some of his story and some of what he was telling me reminded me of one of my favorite videos that I've ever done on my YouTube channel. If you go to my YouTube channel, The Lawn Care Nut, you can just search that on YouTube, The Lawn Care Nut, N-U-T, like the crazy guy, the nut. If you search that, I want you to go there and then search for a video, or you can just search YouTube for this video itself, and it's called Home Depot versus Millennials. It also, you could search Home Depot and Scott's versus Millennials. And it's talking about the millennial generation, and I'm not going to go too much into that video, but the idea was there that, that the company Scott's and the company Home Depot were kind of talking down to their audience of millennials. And I kind of gave my take on that and defended millennials because I've worked with millennials for so long. And I know that you guys are out there, part of that generation. You don't really like being labeled that way. I'm Generation X. I actually do like to be labeled as Generation X. And you'll probably feel that way as you get a little bit older, too. But right now, if you think about things in a lot of ways, a lot of millennials kind of have a certain reputation in the world, you know, that they were the, the that they were coddled and they were always told that they were winners and they were given trophies no matter what. I always found that very contradictory to my personal experiences. I've worked in a startup in the digital space for the last six years, and I worked with like 98% millennials. I was definitely the old man in the room there, people right out of college who were hard hitters, and they were definitely winners. They weren't given trophies for free, but they were winners, and they would want to win. And if you gave them opportunities to win, they would win. That was the strength of that generation. They were told they were winners, and they knew they would be winners. You just All I had to do is, as a mentor – obviously, or as a leader, was give them opportunities to win, and they would win. That's why I like millennials. They're winners. They don't have this reputation that people will say, well, they're lazy. They're video game generation. They just want to stay in their mom's basement. Well, yeah, well, so did I. I'm 48 years old. I graduated high school in 19, 1991, and I wanted to stay in my basement and watch MTV and play Atari all day. So things don't change. Just the way you say things and the way you talk and the way the old people kind of act and react It's always the same. It's just different old people acting and reacting the wrong way. That said, I want to read you a piece of the email that I have here back and forth with this young man, Scott, here from Illinois, just because it's interesting. And I think it will serve as some encouragement to most of you or many of you who are in this audience, because the majority of you in this audience are millennial men. Whatever that means, you're young men. That's what you are. And so when I talk to you in that video, please go watch that again, Scott's and Home Depot versus millennials. When I talk to you in there, I'm offering you encouragement to let you know that Maybe you have some things that you think you're inept at or you think that you don't know or that you have some ignorance about and that bothers you, but you're not the only one. I'm the same way. You guys can tell. If you look at me using tools, you can tell I don't know how to use tools. I have the most handy-dandy dad in the world. He built the workbench behind me. He's built houses. He built kitchens for years. He built choir lofts. He built, um, you know, like 
hardcore boxes for instruments and things like that that would travel in cargo jets. I mean, all kinds of interesting things that he did with his hands. I have none of that. I absorbed none of that, even though I had the best dad in the world that taught me everything. I just didn't absorb any of it. So you're, it's the same. It just kind of works no matter how old you are. So listen to what Scott says here. And again, millennial generation, he says, and we, and we had some conversation before and after this, and he said I could share this. I just wanted to share this one piece of it with you. He says, I bought my first house here in central Illinois last July. I got your ebook last year. I'm pretty overwhelmed with everything involved in home ownership, and the lawn thing is definitely a part of that. Put it this way, I'm a complete unhandy person. I've never historically changed the oil in my car, owned or maintained lawn equipment, or repaired anything mechanical apart from computers. This past season, I've got a gas trimmer, edger, riding mower, leaf blower, among other items. I've done maintenance on the gas equipment, changed oil, spark plugs, fuel filters, and sharpened blades. I've learned how to do the more mechanical aspects of the lawn care, like trimming and mowing, but now I need to get into the chemical side of things. So this is kind of interesting, right? This is exactly what you would think of. And by the way, I, I'm not sure what Scott does for a living here, but I can tell you it's something mechanical. He said he fixed computers as a young man. And how many millennials can look back and say, yeah, I was into computers as a young kid, right? Because that's just what you were. I mean, that's what your generation was. We had computer nerds or computer geeks too, but I'm sure he's some sort of engineer or something. You can tell when he did get into the aspects of lawn care, you know, it was daunting to him, but he went ahead and tackled the spots where his strengths were. He went and added it with his strengths so he can get some wins. He's a mechanical kind of guy, so he goes after the mechanical aspects, the trimming, the edging, things that use machinery, right? Go and get some wins. Love that. Now he's going after the part where he doesn't have as much confidence that he can get a win, but he's already gained confidence in the realm, in the niche. He's already gained confidence in lawn care through the trimming, the edging, the changing of the oil. These are step-by-step -step processes that somebody thinks that way would totally get and totally gain confidence with. Now that you have that and you're in the lawn care niche, now you can go out and attack the chemical side, which is not so cut and dry. Of course, I love the math, and I love the, the chemical calculations, and I love all of those things, and pounds on the ground, and how much nitrogen are we putting down, but 99% of success is weather-driven, and that's 100% out of your control. So that's why it's a little bit daunting to somebody that lives in a world like this, where they're really into the mechanical aspects of things. Now, that's not to say that that's a bad thing. There are all kinds of creatives on all edges of the spectrum with millennials. This is just one that I hear quite a bit. For some reason, a lot of mechanical folks are into lawn care. It's very interesting. We've noticed this across the, across the landscape of the community that a lot of you guys are into engineering things, IT, your developers. And for some reason, lawn care is your thing. I think it's because you like to hack it. You like to understand the why behind it. And that's a millennial thing anyway. Because if you understand the why behind something and you understand, you know, how you can hack it, then you can optimize it. And that's something that your generation seeks to do. It seeks to optimize. Old people would say, oh, you're lazy. You're just trying to get out of work. And I say, no, you're just trying to be more efficient so you don't waste your time. That said, I thought that this story here or what Scott is going through and has his progression, I thought that would be an encouragement to a lot of you because that's the whole thing. A ton of you are in that position where you're just trying to level up wherever you're at. If you're a brand new, if you're just a beginner, if you just bought your first house 10 minutes ago and you're trying to figure out where do you start, you are still trying to level up. And where you should start, obviously, is with the easy things, with the mowing and the irrigation. Those are things where you can get quick wins, and you can be a winner very quickly, and you can know that you're actually taking action and that you're going to make progress. And then some of you may be where Scott is, where Scott's, he's got all the maintenance part down. He's on it. I'm sure he has a schedule set up just by the way he talks here. And now he is. He's going into the unknown a little bit, and the weather can cause a little bit. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today in the podcast. We're going to talk about disease control and how weather can affect that and how you can use all the possible facts that you have to do to make the smartest decisions you can. And then always from there, hope for the best. Speaking of leveling up, there are a group of you as well. I was actually rewriting my cocktail menu, we call it. It's actually the Green County Fertilizer Products. You guys, we, you know we sell their entire line there. You can go on the lawncarenut.com, and if you go under soil optimization, you'll be able to find the, the line there. We got a line of sea kelp and humic acid products, as well as a full line of fertilizers and micronutrient additives. All kind of cool stuff if you want to spray and pray on the lawn. They're a lot of fun. And I actually have a special cocktail menu that I put out last summer, and I'm going to put it out this summer. And it's just some different ideas on ways that you can use those products, different ways that you can mix them up to get different effects or to take care of different things. And I was rewriting that. And as you know, when I write these guys, this will be a free one. I always go way into too much detail. And I try to tell stories and try to relate to you in a way that will help to shed light on things and help you to understand the why behind what we're doing. And I, I tend to do that. And 
I was going through that and I was writing to those of you that are in the audience that you're trying to level up, just maybe you're brand new and you actually have a company that treats your lawn. Maybe you have a True Green Chem Lawn or the Weed Man or the Lawn Doctor or Spring Green or whatever the different companies are. You know, down here we have Massey Services. These are all fine companies. These are guys that do a lot of good things. And some of you are here not because you really are going to take over from what they're doing yet. You're actually here just to understand a little bit more about what they're doing, why they're doing it, and then how you might be able to help it improve. And so by you leveling up, you're just trying to make the service that you're already paying for better. And you can do that by proper irrigation and proper mowing. And we talk a lot about that. So some of you are just going to level up from there to there. You're maybe not where Scott is, where he's ready to go from now mastering all of the maintenance to going into doing the treatment side of it. Maybe you're somebody that you've got the treatments all being done and you just want to understand a little bit better about what your part is or what part you play along with that professional and you're here to get better. Either way, we're all trying to level up and that's the whole thing. At the end of the day, we're all trying to get the win. It doesn't really matter how old we are or what generation you are, we're all going after the win. And of course, as always, we're hoping for the best. Now, speaking of the next products and the Green County Fertilizer products that we have on our website at thelawncarenut.com, I just wanted to mention and answer a couple of quick questions that come in about those. And one that came in a few times this week is, Alan, if I'm applying the RGS or the Humic 12 or the Air 8, if I'm applying these products with a hose-in sprayer, whether it's the ortho dial-in sprayer, the chameleon hose-in sprayer, or whatever hose-in sprayer you have, they'll ask if I'm using that, do I still need to water the product in? And the answer is no. If you're applying with a hose-in sprayer, that's going down with enough water that we're gonna count that as watering it in. However, just keep in mind that the products do need to get to the soil, so if things are super dry and you wanna add a quarter inch of water on top of that, that's not a bad idea. Get them down into the soil, join the tuna can club, stick it out there, wait till the irrigation records a quarter inch in the tuna can and you're good to go. There's nothing wrong with that. Of course, if you do apply them by hand cam pump sprayer, battery sprayer, for sure we wanna get those watered in, quarter inch of water minimum, but you gotta just have a little bit of common sense there and understand how are my sprinklers covering? What conditions is my soil in right now? You know, have you been having a lot of rain or is it dry as a bone? And water there, and as always, hope for the best. Now, another one that came up is mowing in the heat of summer. So pretty cool here. And if you go over to my Lawn Care Nut channel on YouTube, I'm going to be putting a video out this week, possibly Thursday here. I am announcing the winners of our giveaway from April on the 10th here. So that'll be two days from the day of this recording. That'll be probably Thursday or Friday. I'll put that video up and then I'll put up some, you know, some mowing vids from my weeknight lawn work, hashtag that weeknight lawn work. I'll put up a couple videos for that, announce those winners in there. And then I'll probably show a few clips of something I learned this week. And that is, and I mean, I knew this, but I just forgot. I got nonchalant. I actually got cocky and I forgot about this and I wasn't being frosty. I wasn't on top of it. I wasn't, I did, I wasn't paying attention to detail, Airman, is what I wasn't doing. And I took for granted that I mowed on a crispy lawn. So I've got spots in my St. Augustine grass, and you guys will know this too, no matter what kind of grass type you have, that when the heat of the day hits and you don't have rain help and you have no cloud cover helping you either, it's just direct sun, hardcore on the lawn and the heat's up, you'll get these areas of your lawn that turn this steely blue color. And sometimes it's even a little brown and they're just starting to check out there. They're just heat stressed. That should be a sign to you. Number one, as I'm going to talk about here is don't mow it. Because what happens when you mow that crispy grass is it doesn't cut clean and it leaves a frayed top. And so I put a picture up on Twitter of a love bug infestation in my lawn. Again, this will be video on the Lawn Care Nut this week. If you don't know what love bugs are, search love bug problems in Florida and you will see they are the scourge of this time of year. I always swallow at least two of them every time I mow because they're stuck together. That's why they're called love bugs. So when you swallow one, you always swallow its mate along with it. They're real bad this time of year, and with that, I had an infestation, or not an infestation, because that's not the right word, a breakout, a love fest of love bugs, baby ones, on my grass, and they were actually on this frayed area because the tips were all shredded, and what they were doing is while they were having their love fest and getting hooked up so they could fly off for the ever, ever yonder, as what love bugs do, they were chewing on the ends of this frayed material, this dead material, because that's what they feed on. They'll feed on thatch, they'll feed on, and in this case, they were feeding on the frayed ends of my beautiful Palmetto St. Augustine grass that I cut when it was crispy, when it was stressed from heat, and it didn't cut clean, even though my blades were sharp. And so somebody on Twitter remarked back when I put the picture up, they're like, Alan, for the love of all, please sharpen your mower blades. And I sent back, you're right, but it isn't a sharp blade problem, it's something else, and I'm gonna put that on the channel this week. So you guys will see that. And the warning is, or the reminder is, is don't cut your lawn when it is heat stressed or when it's starved for water. And you can tell when those areas are heat stressed, not only from that 
that look of that dark steel gray, but also if you take a walk across your lawn, this will be most evident in cool season grass, if you walk across and the footprints don't come up quickly, I mean, within a few seconds, if they kind of stay matted down, that tells you there's no, that the grass is not permeable, it's not, pl not permeable, it's not pliable. And so therefore it won't stand up after you step on it, it's definitely not gonna cut well. It's not gonna slice clean, it's just not, because it's jagged and it's crispy. So you can always tell, the other thing you do is you look at the grass blades on St. Augustine grass, they'll curl up, They'll, they'll, they'll curl in like they're blocking them, shading themselves from the sun. They're trying to hold on to whatever nutrients they can, but as they curl up, they're actually allowing the sunlight to penetrate down deeper and dry the grass out quicker, so it's a really bad cycle that happens. Now, you get some water on those areas, cool them down. This brings up another question, and that one being about daywatering burn. So we're going to get into that one a little bit too, but the lesson here is don't mow the lawn that's heat stressed. If you do have to mow it because you're in a position like I am where most of it's growing, we just haven't got any rain help yet, and I need to adjust my irrigation, which is what the sign is there. But I went ahead and mowed it anyway. What I should have done is watered it out in the evening. And I know we tell you not to water in the evening, but you're gonna have to cut. So water in the evening, break that rule. But that way the next morning, it will have replenished itself and it will have regenerated. You'll see it. It'll be pliable again and then go ahead and mow it. Now, the other thing that does come up before we get on to the next piece here to the first question of the week, the other thing that'll come up is along those lines is when your lawn is starved for nitrogen, and potassium, but specifically nitrogen, when your lawn is starved, it'll also get a little bit crispy. Even though it may have enough water in it, it's still just gonna, the, the blades are just tougher. I don't, I, there's something about that and some, somebody that has a little bit more knowledge in the chemistry of it can let me know, or the biology of it, or, the, or botany can let me know why that is. But I know for sure when I've got good nitrogen flow in my turf, it cuts cleaner, especially along the edges where I'm weed whacking, where I'm using a string it definitely will cut cleaner. And I can tell when my lawn needs nitrogen because my edging gets really jagged in my St. Augustine grass. So that's something I've noticed over time here. I don't really have a way to illustrate that too carefully or too too much on video. I can just tell you anecdotally, that's what I've noticed. And, and the point there is, is that this is part of learning your land. This is part of understanding things and running things by feel and understanding when your grass needs things based on other factors other than just, hey, it's been six weeks since the last application. And then the third piece that I'm gonna bring up since we're talking about this and since I'm kind of rambling a little bit here is the, the concept of day watering burn. For some reason, I don't know who it is. And I remember this rumor going around when I was a kid too. People would say that if you water your lawn during the day, it will burn it because the sun will reflect, the water will act like a, like a prism. Is, that, is it a prism? No, not a prism. A magnifying glass. Wow. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know my kid's play toy glassware. I don't know. I mean, I had a prism when I was a kid, and I definitely had a magnifying glass too because everybody's burned ants on a sidewalk, right? But they would say that the water would have a magnifying glass effect and that that would burn your lawn. And I don't know who propagated that rumor, but that is very much untrue. Because here in Florida, especially in the middle of the summer, in the hottest days, we get rain every afternoon between two and four o'clock and it'll rain super hard for like 15 minutes and then stop and the sun is immediately back out. And in fact, a lot of times here in Florida, it will be raining while the sun is shining. I call those sun showers. They happen all the time. And of course, you've heard us all talk about all of us Florida, you know, flow-grown folks. We've said we've had it happen where we'll be swimming in the pool in the backyard and dad will be running in from the front yard, stashing the mower in the shed because it's raining in the front. I had that happen multiple times as a kid. Me and my dad would always laugh about it, that it would be raining in the front yard and it would be sunny and shining in the backyard. That happens so many times. That is what happens in Florida. And if that was the case, if watering during the day would burn your lawn, then every time that happened in Florida, you would hear about mass lawn burnings. I'm sure that would make the news for sure. I know they would be zooming over with drone footage. It would be all in the news. Same happens up north. You guys get freak storms in the middle of the summer. I know you do. And again, you don't hear about mass lawn burnings. So watering in the middle of the day, if anything, it can cool the grass down. It's controversial whether that works or not, but for sure I've had those areas that we talked about earlier that are that steel blue in the middle of the day, and I don't want them to go any further than I've let them already go, and I will get some water on them, cool them down, and by the evening they're definitely recovered. So there is something to that, but mostly watering during the day is a waste of water because it just evaporates off super, super quick. So, so those are very common type of questions or concerns that are coming in this year as we're transitioning from May into June or out of spring and into what's gonna be summer here. And I realize that the weather across the country has been pretty wild no matter where you are. 
So I hope those things have been helpful to you. I hope they've answered a lot of questions for you. And with that, let's get into our really our only question for the week. But this is a multiple prong question. It's going to encompass a few different things here and a lot of learning going to go on. So we're going to dig deep in this. It's a little different than what we've done in the past, but I hope it's going to be helpful to you. And this one comes from Danny out of Chautauqua, New York. Hi, Alan. This is Danny in Chautauqua, New York, just south of Buffalo. I have a a cool season mix lawn that I did a major reno last fall, according to the plan, overseeding and all that good stuff. My question is about grubs looking ahead to the early summer here. And I, uh, during my overseed last fall, did find some grubs. So I put down the Bayer 24-hour grub killer. But I'm calling because I've got a bag of Scott's Grub X in the garage. And I uh, noticed on one of your older videos that the approach seems a little more reserved. You kind of suggest to wait until you actually maybe see some brown spots or see some physical grubs before you treat. But then in the guides, it kind of says if you have had a grub problem in recent past or you know your neighbors have that you want to get the preventative down. So just looking for your suggestion as to when I should maybe apply that grub X or if I should take the approach of waiting and seeing if there's a problem this year. Okay, so I'm going to address this one in two parts because he's got a second part to his question that kind of leads in nicely. So the first one here is about grubs. So let's just talk about grubs in general. Let's just go through them because right now is the time you want to be thinking about that, whether you're north, south, east, or west, coming from spring into summer or basically June, a June bug is a June bug is a June bug. It doesn't matter where the June bug lives. If it's a Florida June bug or a New York June bug or a, do they have June bugs in Colorado? I don't know. It seems too perfect there to have June bugs, but I bet you guys do. Either way, June bugs are June bugs. So this is something we all can unite on and we all can talk through. And I'm going to really dive deep here. I actually got to read a lot of labels while I did this. I really enjoy reading product labels and I learned a lot. I refresh my memory on a lot of things. I learned some new things and I encourage you to do that too. I encourage you to read labels on products that you're planning to purchase or that you think you have or that you already have. Definitely read the label on those. And search out keywords. Look at things like when it says it's a group 4A insecticide, search that out. What does that mean? Go down those rabbit trails. That's a way to really start understanding more and really opening up your strategy a little bit more. And that way, as your knowledge comes up, it will give you more courage to go out and experience applications. And then it'll also give you the ability to understand what type of results you should be expecting. So that way, as things move forward, you can adjust if needed. So with that, let's talk through grubs and a grub strategy. So in case you're not familiar, grubs are the larval stage of the Japanese beetle, the mask Schaefer beetle. There are all kinds of different beetles, but we're just going to call them June bugs from here. I'm going to give you some fun little research keywords to look for and some interesting things that I think will be a little bit fun through this. But let's just kind of understand the life cycle of those. So mama June bugs fly around in June. They'll eat your bushes. They'll eat your trees. They'll eat your shrubs. I used to catch them on all kinds of different things. And as they're doing that, they are laying eggs in well-watered lawns. Mama June bug wants to lay her eggs in a beautiful green lawn because a beautiful green lawn indicates a lot of roots. If it's a dead brown dormant lawn or a weedy lawn, there's not as many roots there for her baby grub worms to feed on, and she wants to provide them with a good nursery experience. So she's going to lay those in your lawn because you're a lawn care nut. Your lawn is green. You've been taking care of it, and it looks like it's got some juicy roots. Now, we're going to talk about treating and why you should treat and all of that because I don't want you to think just because you got juicy roots that that means you need to go ahead and get a treatment down for grubs, but it's just one of those things to consider. If you're going to let your lawn go into summer dormancy, that's a whole other strategy. That said, though, those grubs that are late in the lawn in June and July, and there's some earlier May-June beetles, and there's some later June-July beetles, and it can change. If you're in South Florida, there might be a few different generations of them. But for the rest of the world outside of South Florida, They're going to come in May, June, July, possibly into August, but that's really the the time when you want to prevent that. And what you want to do is you don't want those larvae to be able to feed because the eggs are laid in the soil surface. They hatch, they, they burrow down into the soil, and they create this little worm. It's not a worm, but that's what it looks like. It's called a grub worm. It looks like a little shrimp under the lawn. And those little shrimp, they feed on grass roots. And you can imagine as they're chewing on the grass roots, everything above is dying. And they're chewing all during the summer, and there's a bunch of different things that cause brown spots in lawns over the summer. We're going to talk about disease problems here. But the other thing that happens is, and so by the way, every brown spot you see is what I'm getting at is not grub worms, but sometimes it's masked, or sometimes people think it's a disease when it's a grub, and the grubs are left to go, and this and this and that, right? 
And so they'll feed all during the summer. The other thing that happens in the summer is a lot of you will not catch up on your watering. So if you have a hot summer, your lawn will start to go into dormancy and turn brown. And those brown areas will be masked if there's grubs there also feeding at the same time. So there's a lot of things that can hide the grubs. They can kind of be covert during the summer. And this is maybe why you want to put a preventative down so you have that peace of mind. But either way, they, they feed on those roots all during the summer and through the fall. They get big and fat, and you'll see most of the damage coming up in the fall, especially if you have let your lawn go dormant in the summer or it's been struggling in the summer and you've decided, I'm going to have to just kind of call no joy and let it go a little bit, wait for the fall because it will recover in fall. They just Grass just naturally does. By the way, there's nothing wrong with summer dormancy in a lawn. If you're somebody that can't irrigate, you're just going to let it go. That's okay. You still want to get it a little water so the crowns don't die, but it's okay to let it stay dormant for a couple of months in the summer. So you wait for it to come out in the fall, whether you let it go dormant or whether you just had some struggles, and there will be areas that won't come back, and you'll go and peel them up, and they'll come up like carpet, and you'll find these little shrimp, many of them underneath the lawn there, and you'll see them. So that's grubs. They feed. If you don't find them, whatever, then they'll go down deep when things get cold, and they'll just hang out underneath the ground all during the winter time. And then as the spring comes in and soil temperatures rise to 55, they'll come back up again. They'll take a few munches, and then in May, June, bam, they fly out again. And now the mama June bug starts all over. It's a different mama June bug this time, obviously. And the cycle just continues. So that's your life cycle of the June bug and the grub. So the idea is that you want to prevent that larval stage from ever feeding. And if you can prevent that larval stage from feeding or kill it as it begins to feed, then it will not survive to become a mama June bug. And it won't do any damage to you this year. And then hop, hopefully it reduces the populations for you the next year. But the real reason that you want to prevent is to stop damage this year. And so the thing I'm keying in on that Danny says here is he has some grub X already. So he's already bought it. And then the other thing is, is that last year, let me just make sure. Yeah, last fall when he was doing some overseeding, he did find some grubs. So here's two things. He's got evidence that his lawn or neighboring lawns were infested with grubs last year. Whether they did any damage or not, you've got evidence that they are local, that they are there, that they are around within the last year or even two or three years. And then the second piece of knowledge that you have is you already purchased the grub X. So I would say go ahead and throw that down. And right now is the time to do it. Make sure you get it watered in. We're going to talk a little bit about the different products that you have and what the grub X is. But that's a great product. Get it in. Get it watered in. And you'll be protected. And that way, if you do have struggles in the summer for whatever reason that could be, and you do, you know, you got to go on vacation, you miss a watering, you get a heat spell over 90. And because he's in New York and cool season grass is over 90, don't do well. I don't care what you're doing, what kind of maintenance plan you're on. Sustained times over 90 when you're on vacation will turn it brown. And then you can't get it back out of dormancy. I'm just giving you a scenario here, Danny. That's a terrible scenario I'm giving here, but you got to live with it for right now, at least here in our little world of the podcast. So you come home from vacation, your lawn is crispy brown from five days in a row of 90. You get to the fall time and you're wondering, man, am I going to find grubs? No, because you put the preventative down. You have peace of mind. You know that you're not going to have a problem. See? So that's one of the reasons why you would treat for grubs right there is just to have that peace of mind going forward. You have evidence that they've been around. Yes, you should put down a preventative for grub worms. Make sure you water it in. Now, let me talk a little bit about the strategy that I always employed up north and the one that I employ here as well in Florida. But up north, I had turf-type tall fescue, and I had a very thick lawn that I always thought was bulletproof. When I say I thought it was bulletproof, I knew that it could recover from anything. I had trained that lawn myself. It was strong, it was healthy, and it was vigorous. Almost like if you have a, a, your son that you've trained in a certain sport, let's say you've trained your son to be a wrestler, and you yourself are a champion wrestler, and you've trained your son to be a champion wrestler, and when you go into any house, you know that he's going to win. You know that he's going to have a fighting chance. You know that he's going to be able to win through it, and if he doesn't, you know you're going to be able to be there to coach him through it, but for the most part, you've trained with him. You've watched him grow. You've seen his current and past record, and you know what your son can do, and you have confidence. And that's how I felt about my lawn. So I did not treat for grub worms. I did not put grub preventative down, even though other lawns in the area had had grubs, and I had found grubs in my lawn, you know, here and there, because I just knew it could fight through. But what I would do is if, in the off chance, I did get some damage in the fall, I always was able to stay irrigated through the summer for the most part. But even if I missed something, even if I did get some damage in the fall time, I would just spot treat using what he's mentioning here, a 24-hour grub killer, which the active ingredient I would use at that time was called Dilox. And I don't think... You get that very often anymore, but that's what I would go for back then. You just water it in, and it kills the grubs right away. 
I knew that any type of damage that the lawn would sustain, if I did need to give it that pickup, if I did need to treat, it was going to be spots only. And so the idea there was I practiced integrated pest management, which says, hey, if you have a chance to use a, a small amount of product just to cure one spot, that's a little bit better of a strategy than blanket spraying something and hoping that, you know, you're preventing something. Now, in our case here with Danny, we know that he's got grubs in his lawn in the last year, and we know that there's probably grubs in the area then. So that would forego that strategy, and that would say, no, you have you have affirmative, you know, enemy in the area. We're not working on a, on a reactive strategy. We are definitely going defensive all the way because we've got enemies in the area. You kind of look at it that way. But I didn't do that. I would kind of be a little bit more cowboy with my lawn to shout out to Connor Ward there, and I would let it fight through some problems. And I used to get problems with sod webworm as well, and I have a video, if you go to my channel, it's an older one, where I actually show you some sod webworm. I actually find them. I show you the damage that they're doing. And I would treat that, spot treat with a little bit of Dilox, just a super small amount of chemical down, boom. And I felt like that was a good way to go after it. So that was the strategy that I did, and that's how a lot of you might want to go as well. Now, the products that you'll use these days are a little bit different, so that's what I want to kind of go into right now. By the way, let's just talk a little bit about grub worms here. Go search in Google. This will be fun for you. Search raster pattern grubs. Raster is R-A-S-T-E-R. Just search this in Google. I promise you it's nothing bad. It's just something funny. Search raster pattern grubs. The picture that comes up there, I'll explain what it is in a second, <laughs> but it reminds me for some reason of sloth from Goonies. I don't know why. I, you guys can comment below if you think that when you search raster pattern grubs, if it looks like sloth from Goonies, I've always thought that. It also, though, does remind me of an old mentor of mine. He, he was old at that time, and I'm sure he's old now. Tom Higgins, uh, his head also looked like raster pattern for grubs. So Tom Higgins from True Green, love you, man. You did. You were. A, you seriously was a solid mentor for me at a time when I worked for True Green. So this is meant all in good fun. Shouting out to Tom Higgins way back in the day from True Green out there. His head looked like raster pattern grubs. So what is a raster pattern? So I'm just gonna read a definition. I think I got this off Ohio State University Extension. A raster and pattern is this. Correct identification of white grub species is important in determining management strategies. Most of you in the north, you're gonna have white grubs. That's mostly what you're gonna have, but there are other ones that come out. So let me read this again. Correction, correct identification of white grub species is important in determining management strategies and timing of controls. The raster pattern is the arrangement of bristles and hairs on the underside of the tip of the abdomen. So what the raster pattern is, is it's literally, literally the grub's rear end hairs. <laughs> so there you go. Something fun to research, something to understand. Next time you're at a party, tell people, hey, how's your raster pattern doing over by there? We, how, you, how you feeling about your raster pattern, bro? So anyway, I thought that'd be fun for you guys to research, learn a little bit of a keyword. But I want to talk about the product that I used to use back in the day when I worked for True Green, and we would do grub preventatives. We would use a brand name product called Merit, M-E-R-I-T, and the active ingredient in Merit was imidacloprid. Now, I, I know that that is still used today. It's, it's very inexpensive. However, it has come upon some resistance challenges. It's a group 4A insecticide. That's something you can research there. But I do know it still works. You're going to get three months prevention with it if you put it down at max rate that's on the label. So right now, you would put that down. And again, I mentioned white grubs here, but they're all kind of different grubs. And again, I mentioned all the way from May all the way on, there's different ones that can come in. And that's why you want that three months of prevention. You put that merit down, you water it in, you're going to get three months. Now, that's an old school type of treatment. Now, what's interesting about that, and I say old school because I think there's better chemistry now. I'm not necessarily super familiar with it, but I'm going to talk you through some of the things I learned here as I did my own research. And that's what I do too. I read labels and I learn things. Imidacloprid is what they call a neonicotinoid. Now think about that word, neonicotinoid. What does it sound like to you? What's, what's an operative word in the word neonicotinoid? That's right, nicotine. What does nicotine do if you've ever been a smoker before? It's an appetite suppressant. So the way that this group 4A insecticide, imidacloprid, works is when the grub is laid in the lawn and it begins to, to feed on the grass roots, this product has been applied, you've watered it in, the grass roots, the grass plants have taken it in, and as the grub begins to feed, he immediately feels full and he stops feeding. 
and he dies of starvation, literally. It's kind of an interesting way to kill a grub worm. There have been some people say, and I don't, this is what I don't know, some lady challenged me this. I was actually speaking in Milwaukee, and someone in the crowd challenged me to say that this also is harmful to honeybees. And listen, I, I haven't done the research on that, so I can't give you an opinion any other way. But what I can tell you is you have some different options now, and I think they're better anyway. I think you should go with some of the other options, not necessarily because of the honeybee thing, because I haven't studied it. Definitely if it hurts honeybees, I want nothing to do with it. But even taking that away, another reason why I think you should maybe move on to some different chemistry now is because there have been some resistance to, to imidacloprid. There have been some recorded cases of insects that are resistant to it, and it doesn't work on them. So in that case, we're going to want to switch it up. We don't want to increase that resistance because the more generations of grubs that live through these treatments of imidacloprid, the more resistant they become. That's how that works. I learned all this from Matt Martin. I'm not some expert on this. I just listen to every word that Matt Martin says at every conference that we attend together. So what you should do in this case is go ahead and switch active ingredients to get a different group or class of insecticide because it will work differently. It will function to stop or kill the grub worm in a different manner. So therefore the resistance is not adapted to that mode of action, if that makes any sense. So that's where we go to Scott's Grub X. Now Scott's Grub X has a, a chemistry I'm not familiar with. I've seen it before. I don't know how to pronounce it, but I'm going to say it anyway. It's chlorantripole. Chlorantripole? Chlorantripole. I don't know. Let's change, this, let's change the pronunciation on that. We got people pronouncing it Bahia grass now. We got people mispronouncing dithiopyr because it's supposed to be dithiopyr. Let's make this chlorantropoly. Yo, you, you, does your grub app have chlorantropoly in it? Sounds like uh, spicoli. Hey, chlorantropoly? Is that your chlorantropoly? I don't know. I'm trying to, I'm going overboard here, but that's a group 28 class. So that right there is one of the reasons you should leave it. The other reason is obviously Grub X is available everywhere. So go get it and throw it down. Now, the interesting thing about that is it says you're going to get four months prevention. So you could actually put that down a little bit earlier. It also covers some different insects. You can read the label, but it covers a few different insects that are not covered in, in the merit label or on the imidacloprid label. So you want to look at that as well. I think sod webworm was probably one of them that is controlled by this Scott's product that was not controlled or not listed on the old imidacloprid product. Let's just go over the insects that are prevented by this Scott's grub act with this chlorantripole in it. So white grubs, caterpillars, which they're saying they're calling out as army worm, chinch bug, that's good, larva of Japanese beetle. So white, white grub, larva of Japanese beetle in our mind, same thing. Clean, crane fly, I don't know if that's an issue, and bill bug. Bill bugs have been challenged different parts of the country. So those are the things that it lists, but there are some other things that it lists in smaller print that you can go through there and make sure that you do understand chinch bug is suppression only. So I wouldn't buy this product specifically for chinch bug. However, if you have applied it for grubs or if you've applied it because you've had bill bug challenge or something like that, or if you've had army worm or sod webworm, because sod webworm, even tropical sod webworm, is listed on the label. If you've had problems with those, you'll get that type of control as well, and you'll get suppression of chinch bug if that does happen to become a problem. Now, the other thing the product does say is it takes a full inch of water to get it in. That's a little bit different. We're used to taking the tuna can challenge with a quarter inch, maybe a half inch with our pre-emergence. We're saying water those in at a half inch. So you're taking the tuna can challenge, putting the tuna can out, wait until your irrigation reads in there one half inch deep, and you're good to go. With this product, with this Scott's Grub X, it's a one full inch. So just think about that. That might take you a couple hours to get that in. So maybe you'll have to do that over a couple days. I would not spread it out more than that. Get that in and get it into the soil. And make sure you get it in plenty of time because it is a preventative. So the later you do it, the less efficacy it's going to have. One of the things that makes these products effective is they need to be down prior to the larva, you know, getting to be a certain stage or a certain size. And I don't know what that size is with this. The label didn't really specify that. It just said get it down early and get it down before they feed. So that's something we can explore a little bit more of, but definitely in this case, put that grub X down, different chemistry, going to work for you, going to give you that protection that you want. And because it's got that full four months, that's going to give you protection for more. Even some of you down in the transition zone, maybe some fall army worm is a challenge. That's on the label. So that four months can really be something that can help you out there. And as always, hope for the best. So I want to bring up another product though, that you're going to see on the shelf riding right alongside the grub X. 
And and if you do find imidacloprid these days, we found some at the Menards up in Northwest Indiana. Jake, the lawn kid, and I did. We found a product there. I think it might have been the Menards brand. You can look at the video there on the Lawn Care Nut channel. And I think that was an imidacloprid product they were selling. So you'll still find either one of those on the shelves. Writing right along with those, you're going to find a spectricide product. It's called spectricide triazicide insect killer. Now, I'm going to be careful with the words that I use here, but I'm just going to ask you to, when you see that product, don't be a victim of marketing. Make sure you read beyond the headlines. One of the things I notice a lot these days is people read only headlines. They'll read only marketing messages, bullets, blurbs. They want to get a summary of things. I'm going to ask you when you're getting products for your lawn, don't do that. Dive beyond the headline. Dive into the label. Read the fine print. If something has an asterisk next to it, follow that asterisk and understand why. Why does this have to have an asterisk on the front? That should be like a red flag. And it is in this case. So I'm going to describe this product to you. If you're somewhere where you can search, go ahead and search Spectricide Triazicide Insect Killer for Lawns. It's a green bag. Looks like it's got a sunburst in the back. The one I have here that I took off of a big box store website in the top left in yellow writing, it says kills 100 plus insects. And what you're going to see right across the middle of it is you're going to see a, a red and yellow banner. It's red on the left and yellow on the right. On the left, the red banner reads, kills on contact. Now, again, this is an insecticide. This is an insect killer. It's in that section. It's going to ride right alongside of the 24-hour grub killers. It's going to ride right alongside of the grub X, which is a preventative. It's going to run right in there. It's going to run probably anything from mosquitoes, chinch bugs. All these things are riding right along together. This one hopes that it's right in the middle of all of that, of course. And I'm going to tell you that it's not a bad product. I just don't like the way that the label reads. And I'm going to caution you about that when you see it. So again, on the left in a red banner, kills on contact. On the right in a yellow banner, season long control. Then in smaller print next to the word season long control is against ants. Now, here's where the challenge comes in. Beneath these two banners that read kills on contact on the left and season long control on the right, even the way the banners are oriented, make your eye go a certain way. You look at the insects listed below and what do you see? You see chinch bugs, you see grubs, you see mole cricket, you see ants with a tiny little asterisk next to it, which is the one that corresponds with the season long control. But I also see fleas, ticks, and sod webworm. I see all of these pictured on the label, as well as the words of what they are on the label. And I see kills on contact on the left and season long control on the right. Now me, if I go into the store with the mindset that I need something for grubs, this is not just me, by the way. I've had other people send me the same product and tell me they, and ask me, they've questioned it. Hey, is this going to be a grub preventative? I get this a lot. That's why I brought this one up. And you're going to see it's a good product. I just don't like the way it's labeled on the front. Actually, it's not even the label. It's just the marketing pictures that I don't, I'm not fond of. So if you work for these guys, try as a side. I don't know who you guys are. I, I'm, not, I'm not doing that. I'm just, I'm just looking out for my people here. So I just want to be careful. But the long and the short of it is if I'm going in and I'm concerned about grubs, I'm going to get this because I'm going to see the word season long control. My assumption is because the word against ants, which is the only thing that's controlled season long are ants. Everything else is only kills on contact. But because I see both words, I assume that all the pictures on the label are both. In other words, I assume because of the way I look at this, that, that grubs are kills on contact and or season long. I assume that sod webworms are kills on contact and or season long. I assume that Ticks are kills on contact and or season long. I assume that ants are kills on contact and or season long. But in the truth, the only thing on this label that is kills on contact and or season long is ants. And by the way, it's not even every ant. If you keep going through the label and you read it more, it will say that it kills all of the ants, but it excludes harvester and pharaoh ants. Now, I don't know anything about ants, and we're going to go into the different names of some of these insects because it's kind of funny. I understand why maybe this product can't kill pharaoh ants because pharaohs are kind of hard dudes, man. Pharaohs are like enslavers, right? Pharaohs were rulers. They ruled with iron fists. So I understand why maybe pharaoh ants might be tough. But what about harvester ants? They're just simple harvesters. They're just harvesting. They don't seem aggressive. Why does this product not work on them? What is special about harvester and pharaoh ants that this will kill every other ant in the ant world? but it won't kill them. I don't understand that. Either way, I don't like the way that looks because again, when I look at all those pictures, my assumption is that all of those insects are killed on contact and season long. So be careful if you get that. It is only season long control for ants.
Now, is it a good product for season-long control of ants? I don't know enough about pest control to tell you that, but I do know that this is a good product that will kill on contact all of these insects. And we're going to look through a little bit of that right now. So if you do need a 24-hour grub killer, if you do need a 24-hour ant killer, if you need a 24-hour sod webworm killer, this triazicide here from Spectracide is fairly affordable. So by the way, the, the active ingredient in this product is, again, one I cannot pronounce, Lambda Cyhalothrin. Lambda Cyhalothrin. So that's a different type of it. I didn't look too much into that active ingredient, so, so I'm not sitting here recommending it or not, but I'm just talking about as far as what's on the label of this product and its affordability factor. It seems like it would be good if you needed to go ahead and make some, you know, some quick 24-hour kills on grubs or other type of insects like that that are invading your lawn or damaging your lawn like sod webworms and grubs would. I did want to dig in, though, just because it's fun. I read labels, and I hope that you, I, I want to show you this because I hope it will encourage you to read the label. And look at some of these funny things on here. So I, I was, I'm always interested in why are ants named what they are? Like harvester and pharaoh ants. Kind of interesting, right? I kind of already called that out. But look at all the, here's the ants that this product will control. That it will control, according to them, season long or kill on contact. Argentine ants. Okay. Carpenter ants. I've heard of carpenter ants. Southern ants. Field ants. Allegheny mound ants. Cornfield ants. Honey ants. I've heard of all these. Pavement ants. Oh, so these ants, it's like, it's like you're watching like a wildlife show, like these are the lions that have adapted to live in the concrete jungle, or these are the lions that, these are the strange lions that live in the lake, and they go in the water, you know, you hear those things in the shows, here are some ants that for some reason have adapted themselves to live on a pavement, to the point where they're called pavement ants, I guess it's, I guess is it not so bad to be a pavement ant, I don't know, listen to this one, Red imported fire ant. Who would import a fire ant? Red imported fire ant. I don't get it. Why would somebody do that? Here's another one. Nuisance ants. So there's an actual ant called a nuisance ant. Like, how do you know that this ant is the actual nuisance ant and not that one? Why did he get the name of pavement ant when he's probably a nuisance? Why is this guy called the nuisance ant? I mean, who named these things? I got to wonder. Here's another one. This is a great one. How would you like to be the odorous ant? Bro, he's a nuisance ant, but that guy is an odorous ant. So this product will control season long or on contact odorous ants. Close related to the pharaoh ant are the pyramid ants. I'm assuming because of maybe the way they must form up or maybe the way their mound works. There's black turf ant, white-footed ant. There's the crazy ant. Not only could you be a nuisance ant, but you can be a crazy ant. Well, you can't be both. You got to be one or the other. So why is this guy crazy and this guy's just a nuisance? I don't know. There's the little black ant, the ghost ant. Ooh, watch out for the ghost ant. The thief ant. I love that. We have a harvester ant. So one guy is called a harvester and another guy is called a thief. I wonder how different their actions are. Then you have the acrobat ant. I want to be an acrobat ant. Sounds to me like the acrobat ant is the coolest dude at the party. Citronella ant. He's adapted to something. I don't know. Do they live in citronella candles? Because that'd be a harsh harsh world. And then how about this poor guy, the big headed ant? Like, was he the big headed kid in school? Like, is this, are they making fun of this ant? Are they saying, yeah, man, you're big headed, dude. Like, is that his thing? Is that, are they making him live with a physical characteristic that is now his name? Yeah, he's a big headed ant. And is it good to be a big headed ant? Maybe it's good to be a big headed ant. I don't know. And then the last one, the lawn ant. Why does this one particular ant considered to own the lawn? And why is he called a lawn ant? I don't know. But these are all the names of the different ants that are controlled according to this label. Now, one more that's fun that I think you might have a little fun with are lady beetles. I do not know what lady beetles are. I'm assuming that's ladybugs. Ladybugs are super cute. I like ladybugs. I don't even know if they do any damage. I've never really looked at it. I just think they're cute. So lady beetles, listen to the names given to the lady beetles. I will not take a guess or venture a guess as to who named these, but listen to these. So here's the different names or types of lady beetles that are controlled by this product. The convergent lady beetle. Hmm. I'll let you run with that one. The seven spotted lady beetle, the two spotted lady beetle, and the 13 spotted lady beetle. That's why I think they're ladybugs. But are the 13 spotted lady beetles, are they a higher class than the two spotted? Or is it more like a Bible thing, like the two talented man, the seven talented man, and the 13 talented man? I don't know, but I just find that kind of interesting. Here's, the, here's an interesting one, and this is my favorite one. There's a lady beetle called the twice stabbed. 
I mean like stabbed with something, like stabbed with a knife. She is called the twice stabbed lady beetle. I don't want to meet the twice stabbed lady beetle. I don't know what kind of mood she would be in, but it cannot be good. And then finally, there's the Asian lady beetle. I'll let you run with that one how you want. So always fun to read labels, to learn new things, to get a chuckle. Maybe I'm just a super nerd in that way, but I can tell you that when you do that, not only will you get a chuckle, it really does open up your mind to want to learn more, to want to understand more about the products that you're putting down. And in the case of this triazocide, seems like you're going to be good if you want to take care of your lady beetle or your ant population, even if you have those terrible nuisance and odorous ants in your lawn. All right, so after that long diatribe, I hope you guys enjoyed that one. I had a lot of fun researching and writing that one. It took a long time, but I hope you like that. So leave me some feedback if you're on YouTube or wherever you're at. Let me know what you think about that type of research and going into things in that type of depth. But the next thing is that Danny had was a question about lawn diseases. So let's go to that second part of the question now. Also a quick question on fungicides. I know you kind of have the disease triangle and it's uh, probably really specific to your area, but I did have a lot of fungus issues last year and uh, planned to put down preventative rate of the Scott's disease X. I did in my last few mows, I bend down and look at the grass and see some lesions on the blades here or there, but it seems very sparse. So uh, just looking for some guidance on timing for putting that down. Our daytime temps are still high 50s, low 60s here. So I'm assuming that's not really hot enough yet to create a problem. So hopefully here, here's some uh, help and appreciate everything you do on YouTube and the podcast and website. Thanks. Okay, Danny. So we just ended up talking about grub worms and insects and all kinds of fun things. But the other side of the coin is sometimes in the summer, you might have some disease problem coming in there and people will mistake and think it's grubs when actually it might be a disease problem. So let's talk a little bit about that now. Before we do that, I do want to encourage anybody that's listening here, subscribe to my my channel, The Lawn Care Nut. I promise you, I'm going to do a full-length, detailed, Alan Hain kind of hardcore detail math, you know, getting into it type video this weekend on what I call the bulletproof fungal strategy. No, I don't call it that. I call it the bulletproof lawn disease strategy, the bulletproof lawn I call it the bulletproof disease strategy for lawns, something like that, my bulletproof strategy. And what it involves is it involves two different fungicides with different modes of action put down prior to disease coming in. And I'm going to show you how I used to have to think I had to go and get professional type products to do that, but I have now found 100% over the counter, and I say over the counter, stuff you can get at big box stores like Home Depot, Lowe's and all that, Ace, you can get these things there. And you can get them locally, and they are in they are exactly the same thing as the pro versions in many cases. And they're much easier for you to get. They're much more attainable. They're cheaper. You can buy them in smaller quantities. One of the challenges we have as DIYers, we can get professional products. I'm using air quotes there. But when I say professional, they're formulated for professionals, and usually that means the size that you can get is for a professional. A professional does not buy enough product to only treat 5,000 square foot for disease one time a year. He just doesn't do that. He buys acreage. He buys tonnage. So therefore, the, the manufacturers don't have to make small, you know, small packaging of these products. They make 50-pound bags, for example, or 40-pound bags, which is a lot more than a DIYer would even need in a couple years. We, we see that happen a lot. But with that now, I found all the same products to execute my bulletproof strategy against lawn disease and do it with products that I got at Home Depot. And I want to say real quick, I know I rag on Home Depot a lot in Scotts, but I also do a lot to promote them, and they don't sponsor me, obviously. But I think I put out more more good information explaining how you guys can use Home Depot and Lowe's products. I think I put out better information than they do about the products on their shelves. But with that, what I want to do here, because this part of the podcast is going to serve to support that video as well as an email that I'm going to send out talking about it. But what I want to do is just give you a quick overview right now. So the disease triangle, what is that? What is the disease triangle? The disease triangle is when three particular points come together in perfection. It's like three streams are crossed, bam, you have the outbreak of disease. And here's what the three streams are that need to be crossed, or the three legs of the stool to support a disease. What those three legs of the stool are, you have to have a host, which is your grass plant, your turf. You have to have a pathogen, which is the actual disease itself. And the environment has to be right to support that pathogen's growth. So when the host, your lawn, which is always amongst you, reaches a pathogen, which pathogens often carry over winter, even though they may not manifest, they are carrying and they're in hiding. They are laying in wait. You, you could say they're in dormancy. You could say they're in remission. I don't know if that's a proper term, but they are always there in and around the host. 
So then the only thing that really needs to happen to connect the three dots to make the three-legged stool stand up and the disease to manifest is the environment. And so the way you know when you want to prevent disease is when the environment is going to change. And that's typically going to be during seasonal transitions. And we're in one right now. We are coming from spring into summer. Now, it's going to be different in different parts of the country, but disease still manifests. So let me give you an example, brown patch. So brown patch disease is going to be a challenge mostly in turf type tall fescue, but also heavily in zoysia grass and in St. Augustine. And so you can find turf type tall fescue all the way into the north, and you can find obviously St. Augustine all the way into the south and zoysia everywhere in between. And all three of those grass types, even though they're very different, are susceptible to brown patch, which the pathogen there is rhizoctonia. All three are susceptible to that this time of year, coming into June, right now, out of May and into June. Because in Florida here, we're in a, a seasonal transition right now because we are in our dry season right now and we are coming into our rainy season. Our rainy season is usually June 1st on, but May starts to bring in those showers. And we've been super dry up until now. The thing is, though, is our heat right now is getting to summertime levels. We don't have the mild temperatures that we have in the spring. Now, for me here in southwest Florida, a mild, a mild day is 80, <laughs> you know, and summer temperatures are approaching 90 or over. We have that right now. We have days in the 90s with heat and no cloud cover, but we're very dry. What's going to happen is as soon as the rainy season kicks in, that is going to, it's going to stunt the grass, the host is going to stunt, but the pathogen then will all of a sudden have this wet, moist, hot environment. And if the grass is stunted and can't overcome it or get through it on its own, remember I talked earlier about how your grass is trained like a wrestler. You know what your grass can overcome and, and you know what it can handle and you can, you can kind of coach it through. But if it's not able to do that, and this warmth comes in. And then the other piece of the, the thing that we get here in the summer is humidity rises. Everybody gets humidity in the summer. It doesn't matter where you live. But in Florida, the humidity rises. So you have dry temperatures. And then all of a sudden, you switch to very big heat and humidity. And that right there creates the environment that allows that pathogen to take hold, especially if your host, the turf, is kind of lagging. It's kind of coughing. It's kind of stunted from, from, from that heat or from that humidity or from whatever environmental stress. And those three will come together and the brown patch can manifest itself. So what you would wanna do is put your treatment down right now, this weekend. That's why I'm gonna do it on the channel. So that way I'm gonna get myself some prevention over the next 30 to 45 days or so as that seasonal transition comes in. You know, by the time you guys hear this, we're gonna be real close to the middle of May and my seasonal transition happens right around June 1st. I'm two weeks ahead of that, that's perfect. Now, you guys up north, let's talk about those of you here in New York, up into New York, where Danny's from here. You're coming into seasonal transition as well. You're coming out of your wet period. And boy, you guys in the east have gotten a ton of rain, a lot more rain than, than is normal for you. And you're going to come into heat and humidity all of a sudden. And what's going to happen is your host, your turf grass, it's going to, it's not, it's, it's not this, all this rain that it's gotten is a little bit different. That doesn't really wash out the pathogen. The pathogen sits there and wait, waiting for its opportunity. Boom, humidity is going to wipe that grass out. There's not going to be a slow crawl. It's going to be wham, heat and humidity. And that brown patch will come out in that turf type tall fescue that you might have up through the east up there. It can also manifest, uh, you know, rhizoctonia can manifest in Kentucky bluegrass and it can also hit it in, in perennial rye as well. But those cultivar or those grass types are more susceptible to dollar spot. Turf type tall fescue is also susceptible to the dollar spot, but the same kind of thing, those can rage in during these seasonal transitions. So if you have cool season turf and you want to prevent that right now is the time to put down this bulletproof strategy that I'll show you this week and get your fungicide down now in the next week or so and prevent these problems. So that way your grass is protected. It's, it's got some armor. It's got some prevention set in aside there to keep the pathogen at bay when the environment is good and the host is obviously there, that fungicide will help keep that pathogen down. It will help keep it suppressed. It will help keep it, you know, build the immunity of the grass. I don't, I, these are not the proper terms. I'm just, again, I'm trying to give you an analogy to shed light, to open a window to your understanding here. So all of us across the country are in that position right now where that disease triangle has a very good opportunity for all three of those to come together, the perfect crossing of the streams. Let's just pray we don't get a Stay Puff Marshmallow Man -ish incident happening to us this year. You never know what's coming, but if you've got that preventative down, if you've prevented that, you should be okay. And as always, hope for the best. Now, one other thing I do want to say here when it comes to any type of prevention, whether it's for grubs or it's for disease, I want to just say something here, and I've alluded to this throughout the podcast. And what that is, is about understanding your turf. If you have a well-established, thick, vigorous turf that you've worked with for a while now, two, three, four years, 
and you feel that you know what that turf can do, it's okay to not do any of this preventative and coach it through. I will do that right now. I used to do it with my turf type tall fescue. I've told you that through all of these here. I didn't usually treat for disease either. If I got any, any brown patch or whatever, I just usually just dig it out. Just let it do its thing. It never caused any kind of major damage. You can see old videos where I'll show you pictures of it. I had sod webworm damage. I let those things happen because I knew that my fescue, my turf type tall fescue was strong enough to just work its way through it. Now, a lot of you are not at that point. I'm just saying that that's somewhere where you want to strive to get. With my St. Augustine, my Floritam on the one side of my house, that's been there for years. I did have my zoysia on the, I had this one side over here, which is zoysia grass resodded last fall. And I had the front yard, which is Palmetto St. Augustine resodded last fall. Those are getting disease treatments because I don't have history with them. And I know that their root systems are just not developed to where I would feel comfortable taking them into battle. So I'm going to give them all the protection I can for insects and disease. But my Floratam on the other side that's been there for years, it's got such a thick stolen base. When you walk on it, you can feel it. You can feel those thick stolons literally holding you up like giant biceps, triceps on arms, just holding you up. So if some disease gets in there and thins that out a little bit, I actually think that's good for it. I would like a little bit of disease to come in and naturally thin that grass out so I can maybe get a little airspace in there. Nothing wrong with that. Same with insects. I don't mind. It's so thick that when it grows, the, whatever undamaged areas there are when it grows and Floratam grows so fast, from far away, you can't see any brown spots. I have brown spots out there right now that are some from some unknown disease that it gets every year. It gets four or five spots that are about the size of a 16-inch softball. <laughs> so I guess that means they're 16 inches. <laughs> I don't know. But either way, they look like giant softballs in the yard. I don't know what it is. If it's animal urine, it might be a dollar spot. I don't know what it is. Gets them every year. You'd never see it. You can go look at all my videos. You won't see it. I'm not hiding it. It just doesn't show up because there's so much going on in my lawn. There's that St. Augustine... That Floratam is so strong and so stoloniferous, I just know it's going to work its way through. And if it doesn't, if I notice it's lagging a little bit, then I'll do a little bit of spot treatment. I might do something to build it up. Maybe I put a little humic acid in there to kick up the microbes and help oxygenate the soil just to help push it through that way, like giving it a little bit of pre-workout kind of deal. But I don't always think about always going for the chemical. Sometimes I want to think about letting it kind of fight its way through and learn a lesson because I think that makes it stronger in the end. There's a bigger lesson there for that, and I know that a lot of you guys are getting that. And I hope that this podcast has been helpful to you. I know this has been a long one. I know we kind of stuck on just a couple topics there, but it was really fun for me, like I said, to get this one together and to encourage you, no matter where you're at in your lawn, to make sure that this year you level up from where you are. With that, I'm Alan Hain, the Lawn Care Nut. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you in the lawn.